Good morning, everyone. Um, first and foremost, thanks for coming out. This is going to be an amazing couple days. Uh, Mickey and everybody else that's here, all the instructors bring so much to the table, and it's great to do it all in one place. And, you know, over the course of a few days, I think when you leave here, you'll really feel like you got a lot out of this and you're a lot more prepared in several different aspects, you know, for whatever may happen. Might not always be a gunfight. Um, like, like Mickey was saying, my name's Don Deo. I'm the co-founder of D-Day Response Group. We're a veteran owned and operated company out of uh, Palm City, Florida. We've been doing this about six years as far as, you know, as a company, trained law enforcement, fire rescue, and civilians, which is a good thing because most of the time, civilians are the first ones on scene. I don't care who you are, it just may happen to be that law enforcement happened to be there. It's not the SWAT team, you know, it's not the fire department. They're getting the call and responding. The bystanders at the Vegas shooting, at Walmart shooting, whatever it may be, the Parkland shooting in Florida, the bystanders are the ones that initially, if they have the proper training and equipment, are increasing survivability. We call it point of injury care. The first person that usually touches that patient has the greatest <clears throat> capacity to improve the outcome. Does that make sense? Now, if you have no idea what bleeding control is and everybody's screaming and yelling and you just start screaming and yelling in panic and have no proper equipment with you, whether that's just a tourniquet, which is excellent, or understand the principles of bleeding control, you're not gonna be able to do very much, which is what we saw for many years in these incidents. Now we're starting to see Stop the Bleed campaign. It's a nationwide thing. Everybody's getting training. And then here, like TCCC, is bringing a military-based course that's rolled into civilian first responders and now also civilians, right? Which is a good thing. We're not doing, we're not gonna do IVs, we're not gonna start doing paramedicine, all kinds of, in most cases that doesn't save lives at the point of injury. The tourniquets, the wound packing, the pressure dressings, possibly a chest seal, or possibly just returning fire to mitigate the threat and take everybody out of harm's way. Why am I up here or Joel up here, along with the other instructors that you'll meet this weekend, you know, hopefully, and I don't like referring to myself as that, but like the subject matter expert piece. I have done it, I have been there. Everybody I think over the next couple days that'll be in front of you has done this for real, whatever they're teaching you, and that's the best way to learn. We can tell you the pros and cons with applying a tourniquet, the pros and cons with not understanding that if you get tunnel vision and start putting on a tourniquet and you're still in a gunfight, you're probably gonna get shot too. So we wanna instill those principles on you and over the course of the next three days, have you practice them and then practice them live fire so that that's where the rubber meets the road, the live fire. Nobody's gonna be shooting at you this weekend unless we've added something special for the last day. I didn't know about. But my point is, is when live rounds are flying and you're on the range, we get, a, we get an adrenaline response, right? It's not, oh, I did 10 push-ups and my heart rate's up. There's a difference in that and adrenaline response. We want to try to get some stress inoculation, a little adrenaline response out of you so that you get a little nervous and you, you know, your anxiety's up a little bit. That, along with just the anticipation alone, right, of, of trying to perform in front of everybody, do good stuff. You know, that's, that's a lot of stress. And as you're performing these skills and we do it multiple times, you'll get a lot better at it. And then if you ever get put in that situation and you practice this, because it is a perishable skill, just like shooting or anything else, you gotta practice this stuff on your own, you will be a lot better prepared. God forbid you ever get put in that situation. So the reason we're up here is, you know, my background is, um, I did 27 years in the Army. Uh, I was a 18 Bravo, which is a, a Green Beret weapon sergeant for a handful of years. And then for some crazy reason, I got into the medical side. And honestly, it was because I wanted to have the responsibility of taking care of my team, right? We were in these austere environments and I'm like, man, that's an amazing responsibility. Not only being a shooter, 
but being able to be the one that if something bad happens, I can change the outcome. I can increase survivability. And when I did it in fire rescue, although I did care about the patients I was running on because I worked for a department and that was our community, I cared a lot more about my team or I care a lot more about my friends and family. And that's why we started doing this as a company. And that's why I became a medic. So I reclassified as an 18 Delta, which is a Green Beret medic. And I did that for many years and, and had a handful of rotations uh, to different countries and did this stuff in combat, did this stuff in training, right? Because it's not always a, a gunfight or something crazy like that, that you need this stuff. Um, a lot of times it's a vehicle accident on the side of the road. So this stuff works. Like I said, we're not gonna make you paramedics or doctors. What we're gonna do is give you the tools and it's all very basic, but you gotta learn how to use the commercial, you know, the commercial grade tourniquets, learn how to do the wound packing, learn the principles and you will knock it out of the park if you get put in that situation. We'll open packages, we'll put on tourniquets over and over, we'll call tourniquet drills as many times as we can over the course of this next three days. And some of the biggest gripes we get, you know, from other departments, you know, when we train, I was just training a big fire department and they're like, we have all this new equipment and we're not allowed to open it because it's expensive or, well, the first time you grab that piece of equipment, whether it's a tourniquet or you know, a hemostatic dressing to help pack a wound and stop bleeding, the first time you grab that should not be the time when your heart rate's through the roof and you're trying to save a loved one. That, that sucks, you know? It's like doing a magic trick, right? And I'm not good at magic, so I like practicing it over and over and getting comfortable with it. So my background on the military side, I got a lot of experience in this stuff. And then I went to the fire department in Palm Beach County Fire Rescue in South Florida. And it was excellent to see when I first got there, there were no tourniquets on the trucks. There was no tourniquets. People say, yeah, there's tourniquets. No, not the elastic band that you put on for an IV. That's a constricting band. You know, that's not, that wouldn't work out here if we had to drag somebody through the woods and there was severe arterial bleeding, right? It's different. So we worked hard to get commercial grade tourniquets on the trucks and at the time people are always surprised when I tell them that the firefighter paramedics that are outstanding first responders had never worked with any of that stuff. I mean that's a big deal to me and this was only five six years ago. So we've come a long way it's just taken a long time when we think that we've had active shooter events going on for 20 plus years easy and we're still kind of creeping along little by little but the more people we get trained the better. So that 27 years in the military, the 17 years in the fire department, and honestly the last uh, six years, approximately six years doing this, I've learned a lot too because I've come across and trained a lot of people that have been like, oh my gosh, I was in this situation and where's a uh, chainsaw, right? Great, Ch chainsaw, using the rope on a chainsaw and the wrench to do an improvised tourniquet out in the middle of nowhere. That is understanding the concepts and the techniques and the principles of bleeding control. You might only, most people only carry one or two commercial grade tourniquets because this stuff gets expensive. But if you understand how it works and how it stops the bleeding on an arm or leg, you will be able to do that with multiple different items out of your vehicle or out of your house. What is the worst what, what is the worst thing that you could imagine, you know, happening? You know, like in, in a medical crisis, what's the worst thing you can imagine happening? I have any equipment. Dying! <laughs> like, thanks. Like, I mean, honestly, the worst thing I can ever imagine happening, and I've thought about it, because of our backgrounds and what we see is like my kid or my family member dying. But that's not the worst. What's the worst? You said part of it. Not having the right equipment. After, after the fact, going, man, they're teaching stop the bleed classes all over the place. 
man, you know, I, I could have taken this training, but uh, I didn't want to spend the money, or I, I didn't want to take the time off of work, or I, uh, you know, I'm just busy, I'm busy. But you get put in that situation, I promise you, that's the worst. Okay, losing somebody is terrible, absolutely. But the aftermath that will stay with you for the rest of your life is when you know and you're questioning yourself that you could have done something more. I, I, should have known, I should have known about that. Or why didn't I have my kid with me? It's almost like the everyday carry type thing, you know, the mentality. Well, I carry when I go here, here, and here. Well, I mean, we know that there were, on, on some of these active shooter incidents, we know that there were government agents, there were law enforcement off duty that were not carrying. I mean, that's, that's out there, you know, that's talked about. I don't know how that feels, but that probably really sucks to think that you were standing right there and you possibly could have changed the outcome, increased survivability, improved the outcome. So that's, that's why we do this. Basically, TCCC, Tactical Combat Casualty Care, we're doing a one-day version of this over the course of three days. We're going to get little bits and pieces so we can fit in the other training and then put it all together the last day. So in some of these slideshows, because they're military courses, you know, they're in each block there's like 276 slides. We'll be here till next, or we're not doing that, right? That's just, there's a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, fluff and different information that's not important. Uh, but we're going to hit on the things, uh, like, like Mickey was saying earlier, we're going to hit on the things that matter, that you're going to be able to take away with you. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to kick off with a video, and we'll see if Joel can actually operate the, the system here. And the video is, uh, I think it's in China, and uh, you might have seen it before. It's been out there on YouTube. But it's one of the best depictions of uh, severe bleeding, uncontrolled. So how long does it take somebody to die from severe bleeding? 20 seconds, 30 plus or that. 20, 30 seconds, anybody else got anything? I can't hear. 30 to 45 seconds, I like that. So there's some, there's some thinking going on and some knowledge going on because the book answer which I hate book answers, the book answer is two to three minutes. From the time the first drops of blood hit the ground, and it's a white floor and you can see it pretty clear, um, he gets stuck in the femoral artery, uh, artery. It looks like in the inside of the leg. They're tangling up with, they're kind of fighting, and the guy must get a good little shot in with some type of little blade. And he starts, as soon as that first one or two drops of blood hit the ground, it's about 34 seconds. And you'll see what happens, but it's 34 seconds before he's basically unconscious. And the point of this is not just showing that so that you can see somebody you know, bleeding out, but the point is if it's you or your law enforcement or you're in security work or you get in a gunfight and you get shot or you get robbed and get shot or your family member, that's about how much time you have to get your own tourniquet on. Does that make sense? You will. Prior to that, you will start saying incomprehensible words. You will start, your level of consciousness will drop so much that you will not be able to add and subtract and put this tourniquet on your own leg or arm. Okay, so let's watch the video. Guy in a blue shirt with the white shorts on. See him, he jumps in. Say, I'm gonna get some of this. Right when he turns around, watch the floor. So obviously there's some highly trained <laughs> stop the bleed people in there. Nobody does anything. He doesn't even do anything. So is he dead? Is he dead right there? He's prob probably gonna die. He's that fixing to die guy that we talk about. But he's unconscious because his blood pressure drops so low from the loss of blood that he cannot maintain consciousness anymore. The body's trying to save itself, you know, sit you down because he's getting woozy, then lay you down because he's going unconscious. The issue is he didn't even attempt to plug the hole. 
How much blood is on the ground? Some people talk about, take classes, they're like, estimate blood loss. How much blood was on the ground? My answer is a lot. Like, I don't know. It's a lot. I've done this for a long time and I could try to estimate, but it's a lot. I like going by, yeah, I can see the blood on the ground, so I know I need to do something as fast as possible, but also the patient's level of consciousness is a lot more important. Because what if we roll up on a law enforcement officer that's been shot or whatever the scenario might be, and it's hours of limited visibility, and they're off the side of the road in the grass, are you gonna see all that blood? You're gonna have to try to figure out, well, I heard four gunshots. I heard four gunshots, I can't, you know, I'm just walking up to this guy and I wanna do something immediately, and he is not, hey buddy, you okay? And he's like, you know, oh, Billy Bob, he does, you know, he's saying things that are crazy. Well, he's either got a major head injury, you know, I don't see, he didn't fall from a high, high building or anything, and I heard five, four or five gunshots, so chances are he is losing blood. And if it's external loss, right, coming out of the body, we can usually mitigate that if we can find it. Even in, even in paramedicine, like I said, we've trained, I want to say, 1, almost 1,500 firefighter paramedics from a large department down in South Florida, uh, several other departments as well, but that's probably the biggest department we've ever trained. When, when that kind of stuff happens, there are still trained professionals, not knocking them, just saying it takes a while to, to get it that I gotta go up, I don't care what your name is, I don't need to go up and go, hey, how you doing? Hey, are you feeling, what are your allergies? No, I need to get a damn tourniquet on his leg because every drop of blood he's losing is gonna you know, affect his outcome. A lot of people that lose a lot of blood in the field, if we get them to the hospital or the helicopter picks them up, the medevac, and they start, you know, the air rescue, and they start putting blood products in them, then a lot of times the outcome is more favorable. That's why we're working to get, you know, everybody to be able to do blood products. The, the issue is, is if you lose enough blood in the field, right, out here, we're pretty far out. If you go off and do something down in the woods here and nobody knows and we hear a gunshot and we're like, oh, and you were like, well, I was just practicing that technique you showed me. And you've lost so much blood that even if you're still alive and we control it at that point, you may, we make it to the hospital, you may die in two to three weeks from end organ failure because the body has shunt blood from your kidneys which don't rate real high up on the scale. Your brain, your heart, your lungs, they all come first. So it's why we have to look at that type of bleeding and dive into it right away. And they might go, oh my God, that hurts, the tourniquet hurt. Yeah, I know, but I'm saving your life. Hey, somebody help me out here. Like, I gotta get this tourniquet on. Whatever it may be, explain what you're doing, but you need to work fast, because you see how fast a true arterial bleed goes. This one's, a little, this one's a little more popular, but it's st still a great video. Well, this one's a little different, and you'll see why. That is super to remove the weapon. You still gotta check this guy, so watch what they do. Got his tourniquet right on his body, awesome. Watch right next to the victim's, I should say the suspect, right? Right next to his knee, right there. Look at the flow of blood. 
It's not spurting out, right? It's flowing, but that's fast. So what's happening with the tourniquet? Does anybody know? Hope he's had his te tetanus shot. And we could watch this video like over and over and pick apart so many things in this video. I mean, but we're not going to do that. We're just worried about the bleeding control because we could, we could really go on for hours with, you know, flagging his buddy with the weapon, doing the uh, 400 meter dash while he's shooting rapidly. I don't, probably the guy got shot like three times and there was about 93 rounds fired or something like that. You know, into the fit. Look at the wall. Yeah, that's a good. So we're not really looking at that part of it, but that's an important part because where did those other bullets go? Right? The ones that we see, fortunately, that was a wall. But what if it was a wooden fence? Or what if some of the first rounds went over the fence and there's a friggin' family playing on the other side? That honestly, that drives me nuts. That is so irresponsible. But that's training. Period. Period. It's training and almost, I mean, almost no one does enough of it, to be honest with you. I mean, it's, you really have to be doing it every, every time, all the time. So a lot of people will bring up a couple things. The blood was flowing. Did everybody see it flowing out of the side of the knee there? If you don't do something about that, he will, he'll get quiet soon if he's annoying you by saying, I'm dying here, I'm dying, because he keeps saying it. Now he did shoot at the officers. Did you see at the beginning? He kind of did some weird technique. We're, I don't know if we're teaching that this weekend, but we, okay, we might, it's day two. But, but he did shoot at him, but you see how the tone changes really quick. You know, the bullets are for real, and now he's bleeding to death, and he knows it. So the officer, a lot of people say, well, you know, why did he help him? Well, can you imagine this video going out, and they didn't help him? And then people say, why did he, he should wear gloves. I'll always tell you as, you know, the medical professional side of me, put on gloves. If something happened in this room right here, I wouldn't put on gloves, I'd start putting on tourniquets. You know what I mean? That's just the way I am. But if you have the ability to protect yourself, on fire rescue, the tones go off. And we have to walk out to the truck and go, okay, ooh, the call came in and put on gloves and we can get a lot more prepared. If you're driving down the road or you roll up to get your first morning cup of coffee at the Circle K, like a buddy of mine down in Miami who's been a, was a Miami cop for many years and somebody kicks the door open and shoots into your, starts shooting into your windshield, you're not putting, you know, it's like game on. You know, you better hope that you practice for that situation or something that encompasses that situation. So any questions on the video, both videos? Because that's, that's pretty much the real deal. There's a bunch of them out there. You guys can look up all kinds of videos and there's some that are from South America, you can watch them, you know, they'll shoot the guy in the leg because some of them are actually trained to do that. Like he's a bad guy, he's gonna get away, so we shoot him, he doesn't have a weapon, but we shoot him in the leg. And then nobody knows what to do, so they stand around in a circle, all officer, you know, and they're like, so anyway, yeah, you know, did you call, not yeah, yeah, we got the rescue coming, and the guy's laying there, like just bleeding, and they shot him in the leg, but he dies. Ha has anybody ever uh, been shot in here? Has anybody ever had to apply a tourniquet or try to control severe bleeding? I know you have. So back here, was that military service or law enforcement? Traffic accident. And that is right now the number one app tourniquet application. People say, ah, we don't need them. My first one in the fire department I applied was an open femur fracture that was pumping out, spraying out. Applied the tourniquet. The guy was totally unconscious. I thought, oh, this is great. You now he's quiet. As soon as I friggin' got like the third turn on that windlass rod on the tourniquet, he sat up like the, it was like the walking dead. Ah! I scared the crap out of all of us. And he wouldn't shut up from that time on. And we didn't know at the time, but he was trying to kill himself. He was actually trying to commit suicide. He ran his car uh, into a wall. We had no, you know, you roll up on the fire department, you have no idea that. So we we're trying to save his life. 
but he had internal bleeding from his injuries. No seatbelt, 80 miles an hour into a wall. So, you know, he, it took him a few extra weeks in the hospital, but he, he accomplished the mission. But um, that's not for us to figure out. We roll up and we have to do something. Was that, so you rolled up on a, on a traffic accident? Yeah, I got a motorcycle, I hit my truck. I put a tourniquet on, but he didn't need it, but it was all road rash on the elbow and knee all the way down. Yeah. Absolutely. There, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with applying a tourniquet preventatively and not tightening it down. Yeah, I would rather you do that than sit there and war game it for a minute to two minutes while the person could possibly be bleeding to death. Does that make sense? So tactical combat casualty care, we have three phases. Care under fire, tactical field care, and casualty evacuation. So we'll get in and I'll hit on some of the stuff even before the slides come up because I just, it comes into my head and I have to say it. But um, one of the biggest things that we want to get out of this is we want to learn to apply the tourniquet appropriately, effectively on yourself and, you know, or on a patient, okay? We get, this is in there. It's like the, the immobilization of the cervical spine. I mean, it came up for so many years, it's kind of going away now. But like, it's, if you rolled up on a traffic accident and the car is fully involved in flames, and the, you know, the whole, this car's burning, the whole front of it's on fire, it's about two to three feet away from the poor person that's unconscious in the driver's seat with their seatbelt on, you don't, you really shouldn't worry about holding their head and worrying about their cervicals, you know, their spine if they have a, a spine injury because they're going to burn to death in about three to four seconds. So we, we kind of got to get past that and get them to a safer location. Now we can go, oh, okay, goodness, now we're going to do the best we can with, you know, maintaining their airway and their spinal cord and all that stuff. But um, a lot of people get, you know, get, get tunnel vision on some of that. So. One of the biggest things in care under fire that, that I want you to understand is you are actively in a threat environment. You could be actively taking fire or there was just a gunfight and you're in a room or in the vicinity that, and, and you have no idea where, where the shooter is. That, that's a pretty dangerous position to be in. So I got somebody bleeding right here in the middle of the floor. Do I start doing a tourniquet? Do I keep my gun out? It's honestly, at that time, you're the only one that can make that call based on the situation, but we have to be prepared. The, the saying is, you know, the best, the best medicine and care under fire, you know, is superior firepower, right? That's what, you know, we used to teach it in the military. If they're still shooting at you, well, we need to put accurate fire on them to mitigate the threat so we can start treating the patients. Because if we run out into the open, we're gonna get shot and we're gonna be no good to anybody else. Does that make sense? It's important to understand that because if it was your child, significant other, whatever, you know, the list goes on and on, it is natural instinct. Well, probably not, there probably are some people that would stop and go, eh, no, okay, I'm gonna go do it, it's the right thing. But my, my point is, is that there's a natural instinct that we're gonna run out there and, and try to help. There's, there's reports from the Vegas shooting that there were professional rescuers that were off duty and they were laying out in the open, you know, kind of holding their significant other or other people out in the open while gunfire was still pinging off the ground you know, because they had gotten shot and they're out there holding them or they're out there doing CPR in the, in the open. I know that like in our minds sometimes that thinks like that's the right thing to do. It's not the right thing to do. It's, we gotta, I mean, what are a couple things we can think about? I mean, identify where the actual shooter's coming from. Start directing people. If you're one of those people that will take control and you wanna change the outcome of this situation, get people behind cover. Not concealment, right? Does everybody understand the difference between cover and concealment? I don't want to insult anybody's intelligence, but sometimes there's confusion. Cover will stop bullets. You know, if we're hiding in the bushes, 
you know, we're still going to get shot. And that was happening there. People were hiding behind things that were not like the railing, the fence. Like if you can see through it, the bullet can come through there. So those concrete barriers are awesome. But you can't sit up three feet behind them because the angle, right? He was on the, I've heard all different ones. I think it was the 32nd floor. I think the 32nd floor. So um, when we talk about where's a safe area, to operate in that whole area. Where, where would a safe place to be? A shooter with any type of training on the 32nd floor? Like the next county over was probably the safe place, right? In law enforcement, you know, law enforcement fire rescue works off of hot, warm, and cold zones. You guys familiar with kind of that, that thought process? Well, to me, I like thinking about it's all a hot zone. We might have some warms here and there, but if, until I identify exactly where that shooter is, or if I do identify that he's, he's you know, at a high angle, you know, elevated somewhere like that, man, you have, the cold zone is, is, is out of this town. You know, he could take shots. He, he, was, he could have been taking shots if he wasn't taken out, right, or took himself out. He could have taken shots at responding units. <coughs> Anybody hear that there were reports of explosives? underneath the hotel. Anybody hear that? So we get reports of like there was like 200 pounds of something or other, right? Syntax, I don't know, maybe 55 gallon drums of, you know, the, you know some type of accelerant, and, uh, but it didn't go off. So the other thing when we're talking about active shooter incidents, and that's not all we're talking about, but when we think about that, you gotta think there could be a second shooter don't get fixated on, ooh, I got him, he's right there. You know, there was a case, uh, I think it was Walmart, a cut back a couple years ago where there were two. I don't know if it was a husband and wife or like the old Bonnie and Clyde type thing. And somebody drew their weapon and went to engage the one person and the other partner shot, shot that uh, concealed weapon holder that was trying to intervene. So you have, you know, it's like you hear a gunshot or help, you don't just draw your gun and start running through the crowd. That is like a complete no-go gather information, you know, be situationally aware, and once you can confirm that you should intervene or it's, you know, you can confirm what exactly is going on, then that might be a time to intervene. And like I said, you're, only you can make that call. One of the other things that we talk about, I mean, return fire, we talked about that, take cover. We, we referred to the second one as like a remote assessment. Let's say I'm be I hear the gunshots and I get behind cover and somebody's laying out there and there's a big pool of blood around their leg. Should I just run out and get them if they're still active shooting? No, you shouldn't. Now, it, if, unless somebody else has been, sh you know, anybody else has been shot in here and can talk about this, most of the people that I have talked to that this has happened to, you can get in a state of, you know, for lack of a better term, shock, or you know, you're just a little discombobulated for a few seconds, right? You're not shot in the head, he's shot in the leg, but he got shot and he went down. So sometimes doing a remote assessment, looking and going, hey, put on your tourniquet, your left leg's bleeding. Hey, crawl over to me, crawl to me. Try to get their attention and have the casualty stay engaged in the situation. Tell them what they need to do. Crawl to me, crawl to cover. Go behind the building, it's only six feet from you. You know, things like that. Like try to get them to apply their own tourniquet. Or crawl over to you and once they get behind cover with you, you can apply it. And hey, maybe if you can identify where the shooter is and you can accurately affect fire, then you could do that and say, hey, you know, start crawling to me. Or if somebody else, you got, you know, somebody else gets there that can assist and we can have a gun in the fight, while somebody goes out and gets this, this patient, then we could possibly do that. But we're going way down that rabbit hole. I want you to just make sure that you don't run out and a hail of gunfire. I mean, you will be a hero, right? For about two or three seconds, if the guy's a good shooter. And try to keep the casualties from sustaining more injuries. Did anybody hear reports about the, uh, the Walmart shooting, the most recent one? If I understand correctly, one of the interviews I listened to, one of the guys started throwing full water bottles. You guys hear that? Anybody else hear that? I must be getting bad information. No, but uh, did you hear that? 
yeah, so wherever he was positioned behind some shelves, he, you know, the shooter's taking shots, taking people down, and he, this guy's like, you know what, I'm gonna do something. So he starts grabbing full water bottles. And it only probably took a couple, I mean, I don't have the video or anything, but it probably only took a couple water bottles hitting this guy or, you know, pissing him off. And then he kind of, you know, said, oh, bang, bang, bang. You know, okay, I got you, you know. And the guy got shot. So what I said, I'm not saying it was the wrong thing to do, but I want you to think a little deeper into that. Like you can get on your phone and relay very good information, right? Everybody's calling 911, but nobody knows what the heck's going on. We got gunfire inside Walmart. You're in there and you have a very good vantage point. And one of the things that delays response so much is the unknown. These, I mean, law enforcement officers gets the call, he's rolling in, Walmart's big. You know, he only knows where the fishing and tackle and ammo section is. He has no idea what's going on in the rest of the store. So my point is, is you could, from a vantage point like that, you can put out a lot of good information, right? By just hanging out and then maybe you will get the opportunity to take the guy out. You know, but water bottle versus AR doesn't, you know, it's definitely, I think, staying hidden and, and relay some good information may help affect a, a quicker response um, to the situation. Let's go past this one. That's, so the number one thing we want to do <clears throat> in Care Under Fire is bleeding control. I'm not going to say we'll never apply a chest seal or we'll never go down further into treatment of a patient because I, you know, you might be behind cover and there still could be a shooter out there, but if you're behind cover, I mean, if it's my family member or my buddy, I'm gonna treat them. I'm gonna start treating them. You know, only you can make that decision at the time. But in most cases, the only thing we're gonna worry about is uh, controlling severe bleeding because that's been proven to be like the number one preventable death. And the numbers change, go up and down, but a ways back, we were setting at about 66%, like on the combat side. 66% preventable death, that's like pretty important. And those, like I said, those numbers change, but if we look at that, we know that that's a pretty significant number. So if we have a tourniquet within arm's distance and we know how to use it, whether it's the person injured or myself responding to it, I can affect a lot of difference and increase survivability just by being able to control bleeding in these situations. <clears throat> So we're gonna, and we're gonna go through all this, we're gonna move through some of the slides and then I'm gonna demo it and we're gonna talk about the tourniquet and we're gonna do a lot of hands on with it. But we wanna go through some of this stuff. What's our placement? If we're putting a tourniquet on an arm or leg, what is our placement of the tourniquet? High and tight. And if you don't know that already, you'll, you'll be saying that in your sleep after you leave. High and tight, high and tight, high and tight. I'll touch on a couple things real quick. A lot of people, there's, there's you know, two to three inches, two to three fingers above the wound. You know, initially, unless you are like a super highly trained trauma surgeon, you know, or whatever your background, you can identify this kind of stuff just by looking at it real quick and making the call that like the, the blood vessel hasn't constricted and retracted higher than two to three inches above that injury site. Like go high and tight. If I heard four gunshots, and, and, and we're all a lot of times wearing tactical type clothing, dark clothing, if it's, if it's at hours of limited visibility, you may not be able to identify that he's bleeding from the back of the thigh as bad as he's bleeding from the calf. And if you just go above the injury on the calf, you're missing the higher wound. Does that make sense? If we go high and tight right off the bat, they're not gonna lose their leg or arm we go high and tight initially until we're in a calmer, safer environment, and then we can start reassessing, okay? On a, um, how tight are we making the tourniquets? I don't care if it's a commercial tourniquet or something, you know, you got, you know, an improvised tourniquet, how tight are we gonna tighten it down? Until the bleeding stops, period. And if we tighten that thing down, you know, it starts kind of folding over on itself or we just cannot turn that windlass anymore. It's as tight as it can get and we haven't 100% controlled bleeding. What are we going to do? 
we're going to add a second tourniquet. Book answer, people still say, you know, apply it proximal or just above the original tourniquet. Well, I'm telling you to go high and tight, and if you did what I said and you went high and tight on the arm or leg, you're not going to be able to go above it. So just go right up against it, okay? Don't leave any space in between it. Just go right up against it. We talked about that. Don't try to treat somebody while you're actively taking fire unless you're behind cover. Best medicine, superior firepower. I mean, it really does work that way. You'll see like when we get out on the range and uh, you're in the middle of a tourniquet drill or something, you know, you can cover each other if you're paying attention or you can get your tourniquet to a certain point and re-engage the threat. If, if I was to call threat out on the range, I mean, obviously, like I said, I can't, we're, we got some pretty good shooters, but I don't want to really like shoot right next to you. And you're like, oh my God, there's a threat. We got we to gotta call it out, right? So I call threat and you're like, no, I got to finish the tourniquet. Well, what if this threat is advancing on you and they're pumping rounds, they're just pumping rounds in your direction. You're going to take another round and you might not, it, you know, it might be in your other arm and you might not have a second tourniquet. There's all kinds of, you know, what ifs we could do with that. So if there's an active threat, you got to go back to the gun. And then we'll go, and then as soon as we mitigate that threat, we'll go back to the tourniquet application. If you do not have a good plan and you have not practiced dragging people, you know, with equipment, without equipment, doesn't matter. Or if you keep a litter in your vehicle, you know, some type, you know, a sheet or something that you could roll out. Well, if you haven't practiced with it, you know, it's not going to happen fast and you're going to be stuck out there in possibly a, a fairly you know, hostile environment. So when we look at this, and I'm not knocking these guys, these were taken, you know, Marines in Fallujah, but it's all about training. And this was early on when everybody wasn't getting all of this TCCC training and, and we weren't really hitting on, you know, care under fire, care under fire. You know, some units were getting it, but not everybody. So when you look at this picture, go ahead and click, Joel. So he's out there, he's been out there a while. The casualty's given no help. Can you see the red blood stains down on the left leg, the pant leg, left lower leg? So do you, I mean, and, and this is just realistically, I mean, yes, people get crazy strength and are able to lift up cars if their kid's underneath there, but a grown person with all that equipment on, you know, just one hand, it's not a true attempt to move somebody off the X, right? And we know what I mean when I say the X, move them out of harm's way. You know, get them back behind cover. Next slide. So then we're, get, we're gonna get help, but we still don't have a plan. And now we have, you know, two additional possible victims. Next slide. And then, and we do get another one. And look, have we made any progress? Have we really done anything over there? First of all, that, that, that rucksack or that backpack, Get rid of that thing. We don't need that. Get it off their back or, you know, some have a plan is all I'm getting at. Uh, next slide. And now he leaves the other dude and runs over here. It's just a really crappy situation. A really crappy situation, which possibly could have been avoided, right? Maintain behind cover. The other guy is still face down. He might have been dead. He might have been dead from the get-go. We don't know. If we do that remote assessment, if I roll up on, uh, you know, a law enforcement officer on the side of the road, did anybody see that? Um, they had live video of, I think it was in Naples, Florida, or somewhere in South Florida, where uh, the law enforcement officer was on the ground. He was getting his he was getting his butt kicked, and the bad guy was on top of him. And one of the motorists, and it wasn't somebody that was like right up there. This dude like had to get out of his car in traffic from like a half mile back. <laughs> He bebops up, it's the craziest video. And I mean, he friggin' shoots the guy. And then he lays his gun on the ground and walks back to his car, it was like, or he sits down or something, you know. But, so that kind of situation, we cup up on something kind of crazy like that, but a law enforcement officer is laying down there or somebody's laying on the side of the road, doors open, and I can identify that like half of their head is missing, right? Or can I identify like, is there any rise and fall in their chest? If I can confirm that like, you know, half their head is missing or there's no breathing whatsoever, 
I mean, I need to stand fast, right? I need to hold, I need to get more information before I run out into the open because it could be a sniper type situation. Have we had that happen on multiple occasions in the US? We don't hear about all of them, but we've heard about it for sure a handful. So just make sure you never know what you're, you end up rolling up on. Before I run out there, how close is the nearest cover? Where am I going when I get out there? How am I gonna grab them? How am I, have I had a plan in practice? Am I gonna roll them up forward, get up under their arms and drag them backwards? How am I fastest? Is this, is this our buddy that we know weighs like 350 and I'm only like 89 pounds soaking wet? Will I even be able to move them? Or should I just cover them with my weapon and wait for additional help? Does that make sense? I want you to think about this stuff because the slides that we just saw, that's reality. You walk out there and if you don't have a plan, you're like, hey, anyway, I mean, heck, if I'm out in the open, I'd at least have maybe have my firearm out still if I'm not going to drag the guy out of, out of harm's way. So I want you to think like that. I want you to think like that and be situationally aware. So the last thing, that last uh, bullet on there was weapon recovery. So in some groups that we teach, I could ask who in this group knows how to safely clear, you know, most, you know, handguns or rifles. Well, in here, hopefully, probably the majority of the hands will go up or all the hands will go up, but not always is everybody capable of that. Or they may think that they are, but they not really know what they're doing. So if the casualty has a weapon and you have to recover it, you know, make sure that you're doing it safely because this is a dangerous situation. If a law enforcement officer is laying on the ground unconscious with a possible gunshot wound and his weapon's still in his hand and you run up and don't say anything and just try to grab his gun or start putting on a tourniquet or run up right in front of him, if he went unconscious or went down fighting, he's probably going to wake up fighting. And that might just mean click, 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 you know, when he wakes up. And unfortunately, you'd be the, the, on the receiving end of that. So think about those things. If you come up to that situation, approach from a different angle, tell them who you are. Hey, reholster your weapon, you're bleeding really bad. I don't care what it is. Try to identify yourself prior to and have them reholster their weapon. Now, if as you move up, there's no movement whatsoever, you're just gonna have to make that call, you know, how you're gonna effectively and safely do that, okay? Bandages are makeshift bandages used to cover the wound are ineffective and steadily becoming soaked with blood. If you wrap all the cool high-speed dressings out of your uh, individual first aid kit or whatever it is, and they just are like sponges and keep getting soaked with blood, it's not effective. And we're gonna, you know, if you don't already know it, we're gonna teach you the wound packing techniques and the pressure dressings so that you, you have that skill um, and, and it will be effective. So traumatic amputation of the arm or leg. My rule of thumb is every partial amputation or complete amputation gets a tourniquet high and tight. Remember we talked a little bit earlier about when, when the body goes through significant trauma, in most cases there is a constriction and a retraction of the blood vessels and the nerve endings. So you might have somebody laying here missing an arm or missing an, you know, an arm or leg and they're not screaming in pain and there's no blood coming out of it, no blood pumping out of it. Well, if that's the case, probably in a short time from now, when everything relaxes and dilates or opens back up, we're going to get like somebody turned on the faucet, right? And it's just going to start flowing. So apply that tourniquet high and tight on the partial amputations and the full amputations, okay? What position should we leave an unconscious patient in? Anybody know? Recovery position, very good. And we'll show that to you, we'll demonstrate it. Listen, the recovery position is an awesome, awesome thing. Does everybody know what uh, NPAs are, nasal pharyngeal airways, the little nose hose that goes in? Those are excellent too, way underused in my opinion, but it's really fast and less invasive if we roll somebody into the recovery position, especially if we have other patients to work on, because then the blood or fluid, or if they vomit, can drain out of their mouth. 
they're in the recovery position, their tongue's not sitting on the back of their throat. So to me, it's just a little quicker. And I, I love the NPA, but I'm just giving you another option. If you walked into a room and had four patients to deal with or a traffic accident, if they're unconscious, roll them in the recovery position. Okay. We're gonna, I'm gonna show you, I just wanna, because that was up there, actually, I'll, I'll, show you with, I'll show you with Joel. He likes rolling around on the ground. We talked about if somebody's lost a lot of blood, let's say, for instance, the video that we showed you uh, from China, the pooling of blood on the ground, he goes unconscious. If I ran in at that exact time and I placed a tourniquet high and tight on the affected extremity, he's probably still gonna be unconscious or semi-conscious. What is something I can do to try to elevate his blood pressure a little bit and maybe bring him back around? They call it the Trendelenburg, yeah. Elevate his feet 10 to 12 inches. You don't need to elevate him on the wall straight up. 10 to 12 inches, all that's doing is taking the fluid, the blood and fluid in the legs that is honestly doing nothing while the body's laying flat, elevating them and bringing them up to the trunk. And we said, up to what's important. We gotta get it up by the heart, because the heart has to get the blood in order to pump it up to the brain. The brain is like number one, right? But we got it, the heart's gotta pump that blood with uh, oxygen and up to the brain. So recovery position, I'm gonna set this down real quick. But before, when I demo this, I always like rolling somebody towards me and I'll demonstrate it so that they, if I let them go or I have to go back to my gun, they roll and they lay right on my legs. Does that make sense? Because uh, if you roll them away from you and something happens or they're a big person and you can't hang on to them, you end up letting them go and now they're face down. So you're doing probably more damage than, than help in the situation. So if I'm gonna roll him towards me, I'm gonna bring this arm up out of the way, okay? I'm gonna grab a hold of his belt if he's got one, something sturdy, and one, two, three, I'm gonna roll him up towards me. Now see if something happened right here, I could draw my gun, I could still cover, I could return fire, um, or I can also, if nothing's going on, I can check his back to see if, if he had an entry wound on his chest, now I can check his back. I mean, I could, you know, do whatever I need to do. The leg right here, we're gonna bring it up like a kickstand, just like this. This arm that's underneath his head is keeping his face and his mouth off the ground. So if he vomits, if he had a facial injury, and it, that fluid and blood, whatever it may be, is gonna drain out, okay, of his mouth, and he's not gonna aspirate or take it down into his lungs, which can kill him as well. Okay, does that make sense? Now I can leave him here just like that. And his tongue, if somebody's laying flat on their back and you leave them like that, their tongue is sitting on the back of their airway as well. So this is a really good position to leave somebody in once, you know, if, if they're unconscious and you have to leave them alone or work on other patients. And then the Trendelenburg, roll back on your back. I mean, like I said, when it's 10 to 12 inches, it's a matter of drag, drag over a, you know, a medical bag, drag over your gym bag, and just elevate the feet just like that, right on there. And I hear some people say, oh, well, what if I got a tourniquet on that leg? The only thing I'd be concerned about is if there was bone involvement, you know, and there was actual, uh, you know, like a compound fracture from the injury, then we need to support that leg, you know, whether it's pillows or something like that, but we can still elevate the other one. You know, there's still a couple things we can do. Does that make sense? Yep. Uh, LA leg, back or you did that while it's in the recovery. If, if, he was, if he was unconscious and I had to leave him, okay. I would rather him be in the recovery position. Does that make sense? I see where you're going. Like, what if, what if I need to do both? Well, if I have five other patients or another room I have to go to, I, I want to put them in the recovery and leave them there. Okay. okay? Because if I leave him flat on his back and he's unconscious, he's not going to be able to protect his own airway. Okay. Does that clear, clarify? Okay. No, I, just to make sure I'm clear. Don't worry about LA feet unless you're actually there working and doing it. Yeah, like if he was my only patient or I was going to be right in this room, I could elevate his feet and he starts coming around. Yeah. A lot of times you elevate somebody's feet and within a few seconds, they'll kind of start opening their eyes and say, what happened? It's just like when they pass out from their blood pressure being too low. Same exact thing. Does that clear, clear it up? Yeah.
Well, I, that's why I said you can ele that that if you have a tourniquet on the leg, you can elevate the other leg, you know, or something like that. Does that make sense? Just even the other leg, you're elevating it. But if you've got an arm injury, you can elevate both legs. Absolutely, absolutely. Does that clear clear that up? All right, let's take uh, five minutes, and then we'll come back in and get into the hands-on uh, some more, some a little bit of hands-on stuff. Don't go anywhere yet. Got this this morning. Stand up. Basic play. Let's do the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance. 